Hi, this is Kate from Minute Earth, coming to you from my house again. Over the years, Minute Earth has made a lot of crappy videos. Wait, let me rephrase that. We've made a lot of videos about crap. So whether you're feeling pooped out or like a king or queen of the throne, we hope you'll enjoy these four science stories about poop. Starting with the age-old question, do fetuses poop? The little scar in the middle of your abdomen marks the place where, for about nine glorious months, all the nutrients you needed to grow and develop and survive flowed straight into your bloodstream while you just floated around in a sack of amniotic fluid. But have you ever wondered what was going on with your other bodily functions while you were in that enclosed space? To put it a little more bluntly, did you, you know, pee and poop in there? The answer to question number one is yes, definitely. Embryos start peeing after just two months of development, around the time they first begin swallowing and therefore drinking amniotic fluid. This does essentially mean that fetuses spend seven months drinking their own pee, but that's actually not as gross as it sounds. For one thing, urine, unlike feces, is sterile, so it doesn't contain bacteria that could make the fetus sick. Also, the waste products we normally get rid of by urinating, like excess nitrogen, are instead filtered from the fetus and delivered through the umbilical cord back to the mother for disposal. And what about the waste we normally get rid of by pooping? Well, mom takes care of that, too, indirectly. She digests food before it gets to the baby, absorbing nutrients like sugar and protein into her bloodstream and then passing those nutrients to her fetus through the umbilical cord. So most of the potential poop products stay with the mother. The fetus's digestive system isn't totally empty though. Some waste does go there and get broken down by acidic bile in the small intestines, producing a slimy, sticky, greenish mass called meconium. But unlike the large intestine of everyone outside a womb, a fetus's large intestine is mostly sterile and devoid of the billions of bacteria that break down our waste and make up as much as 50% of the brown pulp known as feces. So the green, sticky mass that forms in a fetus's small intestines eventually becomes a green, sticky, and mostly bacteria-free mass inside the baby's first diaper. And in a way, it's the first and last clean poop in anyone's life. So yeah, we've all drank our own pee. Sorry to have to tell you that. But it turns out that even after you're a fetus, you can consume your own waste perfectly safely once you get over the ick factor. Would you like to eat a brownie shaped like a piece of poop? Or slurp delicious soup out of a newly sanitized bedpan? Or drink a freshly squeezed glass of juice into which someone had dipped a sterilized cockroach? Perhaps unsurprisingly, when actually put in these scenarios, most people turn them all down. Even the brownie. That's because even though these snacks are perfectly safe to eat, human brains are built to trigger powerful feelings of disgust at even the slightest suggestion of contamination. Humans probably evolved to be easily disgusted because it saved us from eating nasty stuff like spoiled food and feces. Even now that we have rational ways of figuring out what's safe, disgust still makes some of our decisions for us. Even some fairly big decisions. Take the drought-prone Tri-Valley area of Northern California, which in the late 1990s built a multi-million dollar water plant that used reverse osmosis to recycle sewage water into drinking water. It wasn't an untested idea. Water recycling plants in Namibia, Singapore, and even Southern California had been churning out clean, potable water for years using the same technology. But the idea of drinking something that used to have poop floating in it made some locals so queasy that they began filing lawsuits, and the plant closed before it even opened. Public backlash has killed water recycling plants in other places, too. Likely in part because party poopers called the water toilet to tap, which made it sound like there was nothing between the pooping and the drinking. Studies show that time and distance are some of the best antidotes to disgust. In one survey, only a third of people said they'd drink recycled water if it were added directly to pipes, but two-thirds would drink it if it spent time in reservoirs first, even though the pipe water and reservoir water were equally clean. In other words, we can trick ourselves out of our irrational disgust by doing irrational things like letting recycled water sit in a tank for a while before we drink it. Another trick is to rebrand that recycled water. Singapore quickly gained public support for their recycled water by calling it New Water. Finally, people are more willing to take the plunge when circumstances become dire. After another 15 years of droughts and mandatory water restrictions, the Northern Californians changed their minds and asked the Water Authority to look into getting the poop water plant, I mean, the pure new sparkly clean fun water facility, running again. Okay, so I'm starting to realize that this compilation is more about ingesting poop and poop byproducts. But it's amazing, and only a little weird, that we've been able to make so many videos about that. And here's another one, 
about how other animals don't let their waste go to waste. Humans eat lots of weird stuff, but one thing we almost never eat is poop. Either because we're naturally grossed out by it, or because we've learned that poop contains nasty pathogens. But for lots of animals, feces is a regular part of the menu. That's partly because poop isn't necessarily as dangerous as we think. While poops from sick individuals can contain disease-causing bacteria, viruses, and parasites, and contaminate anything they touch, healthy poops are usually just water, harmless bacteria, undigested food, and some metabolic waste in dead cells. Poison control centers consider accidental ingestion of poop, human or otherwise, to be minimally toxic. And doctors even prescribe poop pills from healthy people to combat hard-to-treat gut infections. And because the digestive process doesn't usually manage to suck all the nutrients out of food, poop is nutritious. Herbivores, for example, leave a third of food nutrients in their poop. As a result, animals like dung beetles and flies subsist almost entirely on nutrients from the poop of other animals. And for thousands of years, humans have built toilets over pigsties because pigs can get almost all of their nutrition from human poop. And while some dogs will snarf down pretty much any poop they come across, lots of dogs will actually use their keen noses to sniff out fresh poop that has specific vitamins or enzymes they're craving. And some animals regularly extract leftover nutrients from their own poop. For example, when gorillas feed on the hard seeds of the dialium tree, their gut bacteria soften the tough seeds but don't extract many nutrients. So when times are tough, gorillas will often eat their excrement to extract the seeds' full complement of fat and sodium. And when the southern cassowary eats cassowary plums, the fruits are so big and the bird's digestive tract so short that the cassowary poops out whole chunks of the fruit. It then turns around and picks them out to eat and digest again. Other animals absolutely have to eat their own poop. For example, rabbits eat lots of the same foods that ruminants like cows do. But while cows have long, complex digestive tracts that give the microbes inside time to break down the tough plant cells, rabbits have much shorter guts. So after a yummy plant meal, they poop a soft, mucus-covered cluster that contains the partially digested food and the microbes in charge of digesting it. Then they gobble the whole package back up in order to recover the nutrients and bring the microbes back into their guts. Finally, the rabbit poops real rabbit poop. Koalas, too, must eat their own poop, or at least their own mom's poop. They have a specialized diet of eucalyptus leaves, which are both fibrous and toxic. And koala babies aren't born with the specialized bacteria needed to break it down. So for several weeks, the baby just eats pap, a soft green poop chock full of those bacteria that the mom makes special for her little one. PAP both supplies nutrients and gives the baby the microbes it needs to digest its future food. As baby food goes, this number two is second to none. So koalas benefit from getting a dose of microbes from someone else's poop. I mean, PAP. And it turns out we're a lot like koalas. This ecology experiment is one of many that have demonstrated how ecosystems with many species tend to be more resilient than those with few species. We're biased towards this particular grassland experiment because it's run by one of our writers. But strength in species numbers is also key to the health of ecosystems ranging from potato fields to rivers to the inside of your gut. In contrast, when a single species is dominant, it can cause problems. Take the case of Clostridium difficile, a natural part of your gut community that causes a severe inflammation of the colon when it becomes too abundant. This bacteria, often referred to as C. diff, was named difficile because it was difficult to grow in a lab, not because it's difficult to treat, but it is. C. diff infections often develop because these bacteria persist better and regenerate faster than other gut bacteria following an antibiotic treatment for some unrelated health problem. Ironically, the standard treatment for C. diff is yet more antibiotics which sometimes works, but in many cases the antibiotic resistance of C. diff means the playing field is simply cleared of its competitors and its population can grow even more vigorously. So vigorously, in fact, that of the roughly 500,000 people infected each year in the US, about 1 in 30 die as a result, even after further drug treatments or surgery to remove parts of the colon. Out of desperation came the idea to entirely replenish the gut microbiome, not with probiotics, which only supply something like one living organism for every 10,000 bacterial cells already in your gut and just aren't powerful enough to make a difference, 
but rather with something more like the microbial equivalent of a blood transfusion. And just like a blood transfusion, don't try this at home. In a fecal microbiota transplantation, or poop transplant, someone with a healthy, diverse community of gut bacteria donates a sample to be administered to a patient with a C. diff infection. And in about 400 of 470 documented cases, the transplanted bacterial community quickly became dominant, causing the patient's digestive system to recover and stabilize, though scientists still don't know exactly how that happens. The human gut isn't the only ecosystem where this germ of an idea is taking hold, either. For example, transplanting soil from healthy fields to unhealthy ones helps knock back crop diseases and make soils more fertile. And transplanting water, snails, and duckweed from a pond to an aquarium helps maintain a well-balanced fish tank. At the moment, microbial transplant therapy for disease control resides at the fringes of medicine, agriculture, and home fish tank husbandry. For medicine, this may in part be due to people being squeamish about their own and others' fecal matter, and insurance companies being squeamish about covering the cost of the procedure. But money also plays a broader role. New practices, even really good ones, have difficulty spreading without active promotion. And that promotion often comes from places like the pharmaceutical, agrochemical, and home aquarium industries. Industries which promote only those things from which they can make a profit, like drugs, fertilizers, aquarium supplements, and other heavily engineered chemical cocktails. But who will promote the simple solutions? We will. From your C. diff to recoup, choose someone else's poop. Okay, after all that, I'm no longer hungry, but I am pooped. Thanks for squatting with us for a bit. Before you go, I just wanted to let you know we now have an official TikTok account. That's right, we've embraced vertical video and an even shorter format than usual. We now can't go over a minute, for real. So far, our posts consist of David reciting some animal fact limericks and ever explaining chemical formulas. We haven't made any dancing stick figure videos just yet, but you never know. Check it out and follow us at tiktok.com slash at minute earth. And it's amazing and a little weird. My dog gave up. Ha <laughs> ha.